I'm your host, Grayson Brulte, coming to you live from SAE's Government Industry Meeting in Washington, D.C. If you're just joining the series, I have to say I love coming to this show because it brings my policy and industry friends together for important policy conversations. I'm absolutely honored to introduce our next guest from GI, Nat Buse, Chief Safety Officer, Aurora Innovation. Welcome to the podcast, Nat. Hey, thanks, Grayson. Nice to be here. It's great to have you here. You're a fancy gentleman, but things are getting really fancy for you. You were recently appointed to the United States Department of Transportation. I had to spell it out because you're fancy. 27-member Transforming Transportation Advisory Committee. What are you hoping to achieve? It's a big step. Yeah, I mean, talk about being selected, you know, 27, 28 people out of what I understand to be hundreds of applicants uh, and then get vetted through all of that and then actually be selected by the secretary to be on this. It's, It's like a huge honor. And it's a bit of like, you know, D.C. wonkiness, but they don't just set up federal uh, advisory panels, you know, on, on a whim. There's a lot of thought that goes into it, speaking from experience. And so the fact that this particular topic is one that the secretary chose to set up, I think, speaks volumes for kind of how he wants to go forward on some of these very complicated issues involving technologies. And for my part, it's a huge honor to kind of get to to serve again in a, in a different capacity, right? Not as a federal employee, but as a member of the private sector, just trying to make the world a better place and to be able to kind of help shape maybe potentially some recommendations for things that the secretary should think about across the department. You're going home, but with a different hat. Exactly, exactly. It'll, it'll, it'll be very strange walking back into the, the building again. I mean, I have been back and forth here and there, but uh, this will be a totally different experience than, than what I've been used to. Will the, the technology that you'll help to influence or advise on will that go across the spectrum from passenger cars to trucks to all forms of transportation? Yeah, exactly. The way that the committee charter is set out is, is really broad. It touches not just one particular part of the transportation ecosystem, but also kind of other things, right? Things like maybe how feds and states should work together, how maybe within the department, maybe research agendas. It's, it's really broad. I'm looking forward to the meeting on Thursday to see how we're going to shape this because it really is the charge of the committee. So the secretary will give the charge to the committee and then the committee has to kind of do the work. Will you, will you touch on policy at all? I suspect we will. Yep. And then because there's a big issue now uh, brewing in California where the cities are trying to take control for deployment of, of autonomous vehicles and uh, from the state level. But what we've seen in autonomous trucking, we've seen in passenger car and from a state level, you're going to have a patchwork of laws. Is that something from, from your experience at NHTSA, uh, your, your experience now at Aurora, you're going to look and say, okay, currently in the United States we have a patchwork of laws. It's, it, it's, not, it's very complicated, not working. We, we want to avoid that at the, at the city level. It'll be a great discussion, right? So you, you referenced kind of my, my previous hat where I spent a lot of time trying to delineate those responsibilities that, and that was laid out in the department's AV guidance. Uh, interesting enough, if you look at some of the other members on the committee, there are actually two people from California. Uh, one is Bernard Toriano, who's in charge of the, the DMV, and a couple of folks from San Francisco. So I think it will be interesting to kind of get this committee to, to gel. You know, my, my hope in it, and you, and you asked me this point blank, is that we actually produce something that's helpful, right? I don't want to spend the next six months, eight months kind of just retoiling the same ground. But how do we make this a conversation about 2024, which I believe is kind of the year of, of AV trucking and, and deployments will start to happen? Versus that's kind of let's go back and relitigate things that we were talking about in, in 2017 and, and, and 2016. We have to move forward. Your company, Aurora, you've publicly stated in, in multiple outlets and, and, and multiple press releases and SEC filings, you're turning into a business. You're, you're, you're entering that's called the, the phase of commercialization. We, we don't want to go backwards. That's right. That's right. You know, I think for too long we've been talking about deployments. And I'm reminded uh, last year when I think you were there, too, we were all at the uh, the TRB Arts Conference Mm -hmm. in San Francisco. And I remember very distinctly one of the Europeans standing up and saying, hey, U.S. people, basically, we don't have anything going on over (laughs) over here. And you guys are like talking about all these like really tangential issues, like celebrate that you actually have deployments happening. And to your point, now we're kind of turning the curve uh, more towards commercialization, you know, really turning this into a business that's useful and not just, you know, a science project or some, some weird thing. Aurora is going to go Dallas to Houston for your first commercial drive route run. How are you preparing that from from a safety perspective? Really, really good question. Uh, we've spent a lot of time and a lot of effort talking about our safety case framework, and there's more to do there for sure because it's complicated. Why is it complicated? Because safety doesn't fit into like a nice little one-liner explanation, particularly in the way that Aurora is approaching it. 
So we are one of the only companies to actually put out our safety case framework and all the things that we need to think about to close that safety case in order to go driverless. Everyone else, to the extent that they did it at all, kind of did it afterwards and they never really provided any, any detail as to how they, they, they got there. And we've even gone a step as we, we almost treat it like a, a financial statement kind of thing in terms of the SEC. And so there's a bunch of rigor that happens within the company to make sure whatever number we're putting out there for the public is actually traceable. It's with, you know, with rigor from oversight perspective from, from my team to make sure we have right policies in place so that one person can't change the number. All these kind of things that maybe you take for granted when you actually see the number in the SEC filing. But the fact that we're putting all this rigor behind it is confidence that like the engineering work behind that is really, really robust. And so, you know, we continue to report that number every quarter and we will not go driverless until that number reaches 100%. Why be so detailed? It's important, right? I think the AV industry in general n needs to kind of be, continue to be transparent and continue to share what they think is, is relevant to, to share. And I think the reason why it matters in this case is because it's quick to jump to a metric of uh, safer than a, a human driver or something like that, but that's not really the metric. This is really an engineering problem. And so we have to have engineering solutions to those problems. So our safety case framework embodies not just, you know, do we have requirements and tests and scenarios and kind of what you would expect from a uh, systems engineering perspective, but also is how, how is the company, right? Do we have proper risk management in place? All these things that I think in the past folks have taken for granted, we deliberately are instilled it into our safety case framework and then have to generate evidence to prove to ourselves that we're closing those claims. And then it's on the operations side, right? That, that's also part of the whole thing, right? You could have a great piece of tech, but if you're not operating it appropriately or you're not paying attention to what's coming out on the operations side, then in my humble opinion, you actually don't have a completely closed safety case. Is it true that any individual on the Aurora team can ground the fleet? Yeah, absolutely. That is a process that's been governed by the safety team. And there is a process by which any employee, if they raise an issue, yes, can result in the grounding of the entire fleet. And then to unground that, that fleet, uh, that actually has to go through a separate process that actually gets final approval by our internal safety review board. Do you feel that it's helped build trust inside the company where an employee doesn't have to be worried about saying something that they feel is detrimental? Yeah, that's, it's a really good question, Grace, and I, and I would answer it in, in two ways. The, the action that happens from someone raising an issue is, I think, what really drives the trust within the company but then also the accountability. So we log every single safety concern that's raised to us. A manager might raise it, anybody can raise a, a safety concern. And then there's transparency in the way that safety concern is adjudicated, right? Because in some cases it might be someone who just doesn't have the right context. And so explaining that context is helpful to them. In some cases is legitimately like, oh, hey, this is you know something that got missed. Let's make sure we, we close the gap on that. And all of those items, so I mentioned this internal safety review board, so all of those items are reviewed routinely by the executive team. So there's another layer of accountability. So it's not just did the safety team handle it. There's another piece of it, which is did the executives know about what was going on and did they kind of approve of whatever the resolution was? And like I said, those, those metrics are routinely reviewed, including like how, how fast, right? You can imagine a scenario like if you're not paying attention and don't have the right policies in place, Someone can raise a safety concern, and then it goes into a, you know, we'll call it the dark ether for six months. That's not very helpful, right? So it's not just the fact that any employee can, can ground the fleet. It's also this other piece of it that we put transparency in place so that all the safety concerns are visible to people that want to go look for them. There's accountability with the executive team. And then the metrics around is the program actually working is also something that is continually monitored. How is this? develop? Because if you look at, I'm not going to name names here, but other industry company uh, companies, if they did this, they wouldn't be in the situation they are today. But yet you've implemented this, not from a mistake, but from a, a strength of power. Why? Yeah, it was something that I think matters both at the executive level to have commitment and, and buy-in. You know, everybody from Chris Urmson on, on down, his direct reports, we all have to be willing to kind of like put the ump behind us. Otherwise, it just becomes a program that you might as well not even run, right? The other piece of it is you just don't 
kind of layer this in without kind of appropriate thought about how you're actually going to ensure that a program is actually working. I think I come at this kind of a little bit from a perspective of being scrutinized by, by Congress or the Inspector General every, every six months or something for my programs. And so for me, this was very natural that, of course, you should look at your programs to see if they're working. And I think for me, that's how I kind of instilled it and built it at, at Aurora with my team and the support of Chris and the other executives is that we all believe that this is the right way to do it, how we want Aurora as a company to, to work. And so that's why I think it actually produces the results that it does. You know, you just can't carbon copy it and then stick it in your company and say it, it'll work. You really have to build the muscle to kind of get it to go. Without your government background, your experience, and it's a what have you have implemented this program? That's a good question. I would I would like to think so. <laughs> You're a very smart gentleman, <laughs> right? And I think <laughs> appreciate the compliment. Um, but but I think there is a little bit of we're all building this to something new, and. You know, when I was in government, I was always reminded of these, we call it these, these cyclical, huge investigations that would happen that, you know, have terrible consequences. And you look at that and you would like see a company make a very similar mistake like two or three years later. It's like, did they not learn anything from the previous people? And so I think that's what I bring from my government background is just kind of that perspective of learning from others. So when you look at what we built at Aurora, whether it be the safety case or something we call safety management systems, those aren't things that I invented in my, in, in my head. Those are things that we looked at what, how do other safety critical industries solve some of these very challenging issues? And there's examples all over the place. And so as safety management systems, for example, comes from most notably kind of the FA land, but other modes of transportation have it. And then when you look at safety cases, that comes from a completely different industry. It doesn't even have anything to do with, with what we're doing in transportation but it has a lot of good similarities where you're trying to make a logical claims-based argument of whatever the thing that you're doing is whatever you say it's going to do. And so that methodical breakdown and then providing the evidence to actually say that you've met those is kind of what was the big unlock, I think, for me, um, particularly to try to take ABs and kind of make it scale. On the theme of learning from others, Aurora's a partnership with Continental. What yes. are you learning from Continental? I was very fortunate. Kirby Howard, thank you. I was able to sit down with their CFO and their, yeah. their CTO for a deep dive. And I, I walked away and I said to Kirby, wow. That was just an hour with that team. You Obviously, you're in the trenches from them. What have you learned? Yeah, I think it's uh, great. Where for one, I get to see Kirby now more often than I did before. <laughs> uh, but that aside, you know, I think I, I, knew, I actually knew some of the Continental team, obviously, from my, my, my previous role, but mostly dealt with them more on the crash avoidance side of, of things. And... You know, they bring a certain level of expertise to the table that is unparalleled. And the big factor for us is how do you take this technology that now you've, you know, sort of started approach deployment and then scale it? I mean, you're always talking about scale and all the podcasts that you do, it's all about let's, how are we going to scale this thing? How are we actually going to make this thing useful? Well, you can't make it useful unless you have someone who actually knows how to build equipment at scale. And so that's kind of the big unlock with, with Conti. And so there's a lot of work that happened kind of in the background to understand kind of functional requirements and kind of the final design, which is all part of the, what, what we kind of recently an announced. And then kind of taking that and, okay, like now that has to be built, has to be built, you know, at some cadence. And it also has to be kind of driven the cost out of it to make it economically feasible. And so those, those are kind of the skill set that Conti's bringing to the table. And then kind of what we're bringing to the table is like, this is how we, Think about, you know, replicating the driving tasks with software and kind of where these components are on, on the vehicle. And it just makes this partnership just so unique. It's kind of a, in, in the industry in general, but I just think it makes a lot of sense where we're kind of now paired up with someone who can build automotive grade equipment at scale uh, and then kind of have those relationships just right off the bat. The key is scale and con yeah. Conti can scale and make great hardware from a safety perspective. What input or insight do you have? At, and so there's, it's a redundant system. I'll be yep. very clear. It's a redundant it. system. Yep. What overview do you do you have? So you have all this experience from NHTSA. You have the experience in the private sector. Do you advise Conti on certain things that need to be in the hardware or software, or is it a is it a collaborative relationship? Yeah, for sure. Any relationship is going to be you know collaborative, particularly with the players that are involved. I would say for us, it's really driven from, again, probably sound like a little bit like a broken record, but it's kind of driven from the claims that we have in the safety case. And we have to fulfill those claims. And those claims require 
engineering evidence. And so that's where, you know, whether it's Conti or even whether it's our, our platform partners, meaning, you know, Volvo or, or, or PACCAR, where they even have to provide certain engineering deliverables so that we can completely close our safety case. So that just gives you a sense of how we're thinking about the engineering problem, right? That way it's not just, okay, we're gonna get this part from somebody, we're gonna get this part from somebody and put them together and hope it works. Oh, no, no, there's actually work to make sure they actually do work. And those are embedded in the claims in, 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 in the safety case. And so that's where kind of the redundancy piece comes in. That's where kind of some of these other aspects come in. Is redundancy a large part of the safety case for all your partners? It is certainly a key piece of it. I haven't done the math to figure out, you know, on a percentage basis what, what it means. I would say, if you think about it, there's kind of uh, a couple of big pieces of our safety case. One is nominal driving, basically, can you get from point A to point B under whatever conditions you say you can do that in. Then kind of another big piece is like, okay, what happens when things go wrong? You know, you, you have to get the system to a safe spot. The other piece of it then is really more around, okay, you're out there, how do you catch things early? right? This idea of continuous monitoring and fixing things as, as things happen. Then there's kind of pieces around, okay, what if somebody puts a cone in the car, you know, or the truck, right? All of these things are things we have to think about, right? And then the last piece is like, are we really good partners with the public, the government, those kind of things. So again, if you think about all of these things, they sound pretty intuitive, right? But when you break them down to actually figure out like, have I answered all these questions, the delib deliberate thought process to make you do that, is pretty powerful. How do you mitigate that risk? Because that's just all built in Which the Which one? The, the whole thing. Because if you look at it, if, if for instance, you have a, a, an issue with a, a, a truck or a blown tire, it has to be able to pull to the yep. side of the road, or if something fails to be able to pull to the side of the road, do you look at all those different scenarios from just, it's called traditional trucking data of everything that could potentially happen yeah. put into a, a pot and figure it out? That's right. That's exactly right. So those are part of, maybe there's one claim that says, you know, are these things that you thought about? And then within that, there's a bunch of evidence that you produce to say, I did. Wow. The one thing I think a lot about with the 18 whalers, uh, I'm a kid, so I think about the, the runaway truck, but well, that's a conversation for another day, but is winds. Um, driving, if you look at driving from Los Angeles um, to Vegas and you have to go through Barstow and you have those winds, do you, do you put all the weather factors into that potential thing into your safety case of, of this or, or that? Yeah, so the way to make it scalable is you kind of say, okay, what is the operational design domain? Like, wh where am I trying to operate? And what are the factors there that I need to worry about? So you mentioned Dallas to Houston is kind of the thing. So there are certain things that we need to know about that operational design domain in order to close the claims associated with that. Well, if we go to another op uh, operational design domain and there's new factors, let's say it snows there, you know, four or five days out of the year, whatever mm -hmm. the answer yep. is, then you, gotta you, get, you have to close that now because it's different, you know? And, and so the beauty of the safety case is, if you think about it, you don't have to go back and redo everything that you did before because now you know exactly what you're impacting when you go to the next ODD, the next ODD. So in your example, if we go to the next ODD and wind is a thing we need to worry about, then that will be evidence that needs to be created for us to be able to close that particular claim related to the operational design domain. So a, hypo a hypothetical, so Dallas to Houston, very public, and I think you are testing uh, Dallas to El Paso, but let's just say you eventually go there, drive out. Do you just build onto the safety case and that the different elements that you're going to see there? Yep. And then, okay, so then you're operating ter terminal to terminal is, is mm -hmm. the way that your system's designed. Do you look into the human factors element of that? Because you're in a terminal, there's a human-driven truck, there's an autonomous truck, and oh, by the way, there's a the guy driving the forklift to, to get the load off the truck. Yeah, there's a couple of different pieces there that, and it, again, it depends on how that terminal ter terminal operation is, is set up. So kind of in the, in the current state, we don't, we're not loading trailers at our facilities, but maybe that comes down, down the road. But your point, broader point about the human factors piece associated with that is, is very, very relevant. And that's actually something that other industries have addressed. Mining, for example, mining has machines, robots doing interesting work alongside humans. And they've solved many of the issues involving with those humans interacting with those machines. Manufacturing plants, same thing. They have robots doing welding, all sorts of things. They've addressed the way to figure out how to make sure people are not in a general area when those machines are doing their work. We have to do the same thing. And that would be part of our safety case. I mentioned there's a piece there around operations. One of the things that my team actually has to practice oversight on is, is those operations. So I have folks on my team that 
specifically our uh, subject matter experts in, let's call it terminal operations, on the safety team. And then we also have similar expertise on, on the ops team. So those two folks work pretty well together to kind of make sure we are thinking through all of the different issues that can occur inside a terminal, you know, when you have robots working with people. When you're in a terminal, is day one is a divide where let's say north side is autonomous only, south side is human only, and then you start as your technology evolves, the the human interaction evolves that you eventually mix them at some point? Is that how, to limit your risk? That's not how I think about it. I, I, or I don't think about it in terms of like, uh, that that's what changes the thing. It's really more around what are the safety issues that you're trying to guard against? And then that's how I, that's how I think about it in terms of, okay, then what claims and what evidence do I need to close to ensure that when that thing happens, you know, those two things, whatever risk you were concerned about, that it's appropriately mitigated, that it's not this kind of open-ended loop where you didn't think about it. And again, like part of the beauty of the safety case is there's a specific thing in there around, well, how are you going to monitor this thing to make sure that it still meets your expectations? And that's a very crucial piece of it. So let's say hypothetically, if you uh, started seeing some increased interactions, uh, close calls or something like that, then you would want to go back and say, okay, is there something that I, I need to you know, kind of further improve to, to limit those interactions or are those interactions okay, right? Monitoring is a big piece of kind of the power of the safety case as well because you kind of go in it with this uh, humble view that we're all human, might have missed something, and so let's make sure we have the right monitoring in place to make sure that when issues pop up, again, you have a proper resolution process. This is very similar to kind of the safety concern side of things, right? So you want to kind of layer in that same framework, though, but for the safety case itself. So you're, you're monitoring everything. Yeah, I mean, and, and it sounds maybe more complicated than I need it to, to sound, but you have to be able to measure the performance of whether it be your autonomy system, whether it be the controls that you think you have in place to make sure they're still effective. I mean, all of these things are not that complicated per se, but you just need to put them in place and then kind of put the, the uh, oversight and governance function on top of it to make sure that, again, that these things are actively being monitored, actively being resolved, not sitting around for days on end if the risk is not appropriate for it to be sitting around for day, days on end. What does it look like when you, you ship a new hardware update? Does that have to go through a governance? Does that have to go through a safety review? What does that process look yeah, like? Yeah, so one of the things we, as we turn the, we'll call it turn the crank on our, our first safety well, like case. That. That's right. I got a Model T if you want to go for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised by that. <laughs> but, you know, as, as, we, as we kind of build that, that muscle and turn the crank, we will want to then do the next thing, which is, okay, how do we then do this faster? How do we do this in a way that doesn't take a long time to do, but still is, has the high bar of, of safety? So that's some work actually my team is doing right now is looking at, okay, when we look at our kind of version of this safety case, what changes do we want to make as things change so that we can better isolate which claims are impacted and then therefore be very focused on which evidence needs, needs, needs to change? Because again, it still has to ladder up into a structured argument that makes sense, right? If you start doing willy nilly things with your argument, then your argument won't hold hold water. Let's say fast forward to the future, no timeline on this. Aurora's operating drive route in multiple states, commercial runs for your partners. Yeah, that's gonna be today. It's gonna be a good day. It's gonna be a great day for the economy and a great day for your company yes. and the industry. How, great day for safety too. A great day for safety. And that's where I'm going with this. How do you maintain that high level of safety? It's a challenge. It's a challenge like any other consumer product. And I think one of the things that we will have to do, and I hate to sound like a broken record on this, but we have to make sure we have the right indicators in place so that we can catch things early and earlier in, in, in the process, right? That's, that'll be a, a key piece of this. And that's really what we'll, we'll say maybe, maybe in scale, it's not that different than today or on today's vehicles, right? Like I think when you look at the system we have in place today, manufacturers monitor all sorts of things that come in you know, to their systems, whether that be through warranties or whatever, and there's a process that they have to follow to let them to know and all these kind of things. We can argue about how that process works good, bad, or indifferent, but there actually is a process in place. So we don't have to invent some new thing now just because we have self-driving vehicles and, and operations with, with trucks. Uh, likewise, FMCSA, I don't know if you know this, but, you know, they're a regulatory agency as well and have, you know, cops and oversight and everything else like that. And so 
uh, trucking is unique in the sense that you, there's a NHTSA piece, there's an FMCSA piece, you know, there's, there's lots of people practicing oversight. Uh, and so to me, there'd be a natural extension for expectations that are on us as a company, first and foremost, our partners, right? Anybody else is in the ecosystem with us, but plus also the regulators who are, pra- all of those people are practicing oversight. It's interesting you say that I had an Uber driver on the way here. He's a former uh, 18-wheel over-the-road driver, and he's now, oh, interesting. And he's, he's retired driving for Uber. And we just start having this conversation. I don't tell him I do because I tell him I work in the autonomy industry. They don't like me. But this gentleman was going on and on and, and brought up autonomous trucks out of the blue. Well, okay, so I'm listening to this gentleman. And he said, do you know the problem with the hours of service? You're fatigued. You don't know if I got a good night's sleep. I'm, I'm stressed out and you've, you've got me on this limit so I can't pull over and take a nap. That's what's wrong. And that's why autonomous trucks are going to win. I said that because I'm retired and I drive the Uber now. This gentleman was, was bringing up all these really interesting fatigue issues. Your trucks are not going to get fatigued. How do we take what the Uber driver told me and put it into a nice Aurora message and tell that to the public? So I think there's a lot of benefits we can talk about that. You know, we, we haven't got there yet because we actually need to close our safety case and <laughs> be able to deploy the truck. But let's say if you take a step back, right, there's, you know, there's obviously economic benefits, right? There, the goods get there kind of on a time that is measurable, right? They get there on, on a cadence that is not worrying about whether someone needs to take a, a necessary bio break, whether someone is like, you know, feathering the speed limit way too fast or whatever the issue may be, right? Because if you look at the crash picture, right, we've got kind of some problems, we've got some challenges, uh, whether it be distraction, you know, you mentioned fatigue, there's other now issues creeping into the, the system, you know, at least on the light vehicle side, we still have some challenges with, with alcohol, there's drugs now in there. So there's all these human issues that are documented, they're not fake. You know, some people like to go, oh, you know, this, well, I can't lie, the data is what it says, right? And these systems won't do that, right? And so we do as an industry though, I think, again, going back to what I said about, this is an engineering problem. We need to prove first that we've solved the engineering challenge. And then these other benefits will come as a result of getting this technology out there in mass. I mean, I've been a big believer of this technology for a while because I'm of the opinion that 43,000 people is a lot of people that don't have to die, right? That is a astronomical number. I think the challenge we have in, in the United States and maybe around the globe is that these crashes happen like in bits and pockets in some neighborhood that maybe you're, you're not in that particular day, but they're real death toll on society, not just the fatalities. Then you talk about the economic impact of being stuck in traffic. You talk about the economic impact that happens to those, those families and those jobs that are, that are not going to happen because that particular individual is not there anymore. Like these are real costs that we have somewhat desensitized ourselves to, and we knew we need to do a better job. So like one of the challenges, for example, when you go to someone, you say, well, fatigue is a big problem. They'll look at you, well, I never drive fatigued. Uh, And it's like, yeah, my name's Homer J. Simpson. (laughs) How do you know you're not fatigued, right? (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Those systems are coming on vehicles, but they're not there yet. So, you know, I, I think there is a natural tendency for humans that's you know drive around every day to decide to kind of displace and say well it's the other person it's not really me and i think this is where autonomous technology can have a huge impact which is like you know there's a machine that's now doing a lot of the things that we can take for granted uh, and doing it in a way that's that's safer uh, and bring huge benefits to society uh, and i believe completely transform the way goods are moved in this country, people are moved in this country, uh, and, and, and the like. And it's going to change the world, and it's going to be good. It's going to be a safer road. So I can sit here and make an argument to you today. When an economy on the brink, fatigue is up, stress is up, I think at some point, I'm not going to give a date, but at some point, you're going to have more people driving high while than drunk, just the way all the, all the data is going. Yeah. And then you have all the distracted driving. So the 43,000 number is as scary as bad as it is today. If we don't figure out Tommy, that number's going to grow. That's right. And that's scary. That's right. And, and I think it also can't be all on Tommy. Like there, we need a lot of tools to stay, as, as you know, being in this transportation space for a long time. You know, it takes 20 years or so to get a single piece of technology to penetrate the fleet, to get to maybe 70, 80 percent, not even 100, 70 or 80 percent. A long time. So like we got to get on with it and we need to continue to invest across the board. Uh, but I think you know, the technology that we're work, working on at, at Aurora is 
a key piece in the in, in the in the toolbox, let's say, and we would be remiss to not use it, you know, to have it at our disposal and continue to kind of foster the innovation to go forward. Are there going to be bumps along the way for sure? We need to m learn from those bumps and kind of keep going forward and not using it as a way to kind of like, oh, let's let's reset. You know, you mentioned the the Model T. I, I don't hear too many people wanting to go out and you know crank vehicles anymore by by hand, right? You know, everybody's got push button start now, basically. But so, you know, technology evolves and that's just a convenience thing. That is not even really a, a, a safety thing. You know, you can go back in the old days and look at vehicles that didn't have airbags. Like, I don't see too many people wanting to run around with vehicles with no airbags anymore. And now cars are full of airbags. And again, that's just, that only is a technology that appears in the most awful of circumstances, right? You're, you're basically, the crash has happened. Now you're just trying to protect the human body. What we're talking about here is the thing doesn't even happen. Like it literally does not happen. What a, what a what a day that will be when we actually get these in appreciable numbers on, on on the roads. It's going to save lives. It's also going to help the economy. I started looking yes. at some health data, the amount of money that we spend as a country on on health services for individuals involved in in, in, cr in crashes, both fatal and non-fatal, is very high. And so you, you develop this great technology, which is good for your partners from an economic standpoint. But look at the societal benefit from an economic standpoint from the health the health cost decreased. Yeah, that's really positive. You're you're scaling up. You're getting ready for a drive route. You're going to go drive route at, at some point. Yes. on the Dallas Houston run. What goes into that from a preparation standpoint? Is it is an all hands on deck? Is everybody working towards a goal? And then when when the safety framework meets 100 percent, then it goes for a final review or, or what goes into that drive route? Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, you've you've sort of nailed it. Right. So, you know, there's our framework. There's the evidence that needs to be com completed to close that that framework. And we have a very big milestone coming up with uh, Aurora Driver Ready, uh, which, you know, for you in the audience is really to say that are that's all the pieces that the evidence around them is is closed with the exception of we need a platform, right? We need a truck that has the right redundancies and all those kind of things. And then only once those two pieces are done, then we're gonna go driverless, right? I, I think the days of one-off stunts is kind of like, you know, we, we've already did that life. That was, you know, circa 2016. You and I probably remember that very well. You know, this is about the- Are real you gonna deal. police cars this, follow, follow you and <laughs> shut down no, exits? No, that's not how it happens. <laughs> uh, this is really about building a commercial business that is reliable uh, that is safe, you know, that customers will find value in. Otherwise, it doesn't matter, at least in my opinion, right? So this is really about doing this in a way that actually scales, doing this in a way that is methodical, doing this in a way that kind of matches what the customer's expectations, what the product is supposed to do. Um, all of those things have to come together. So you're right. When we get all of our pieces together, uh, we will have that completed safety case and we will go talk to the safety review board and we will see, you know, are there the things that we need to, not so sure we, we think we closed it correctly or, hey, this, this seems like this is good enough, you know, safety concerns or like all of these different things will go into that decision, right? And it'll be a big decision, right? And then we have to go then make sure and work with our partners and everybody else before we go. Do you go sit down with law enforcement as well? Yes. Yeah, that's a big, I mean, and we already do that work now. You know, there's a uh, ABSC best practice, for example, around interactions with first responder. That's all, all the things that we uh, have already kind of addressed. Uh, and now it's really about kind of some last pieces around validation that we're, we're looking to close. But, you know, whether it's law enforcement, public safety officials, those, those are important stakeholders for sure. So all those stakeholders will know, I'm not going to ask for time, but they will know prior to Aurora going drive route on that route. They'll be well briefed and noted. Yeah, I think if you look at Aurora's track record, we are the kind of the company of no surprises, right? So mm -hmm. people shouldn't be surprised when the safety case is closed that we say we're going to commercially go drive. We've been telling people that for like 24 months now or something uh, and been reporting the progress on that, that number. That's kind of the public piece of it. There's also the conversation that is needed and had with, with the regulators for sure on, you know, here's our progress, you know, so Whatever that cadence is, we go in there and we talk to them about the progress, talk about things that we've, we've closed, interesting things that happen, whatever they want to know, right? It's, this is not trying to come at this in a way where we're going to do it no matter what they say. It's like, no, this is, everybody has to kind of like row in the same direction. And part of the way you help everybody row in the same direction is you be transparent about what, what you're doing. And I think we've been a company for a long time that has been transparent in the way that we're doing this. And that goes back to your culture, 
I mean, how is the safety culture at Aurora developed and how are you nurturing it? Yeah, super, super proud of the way that we've continued to nurture the safety culture. We, we actually measure it. It's a hard thing to do, but we, we actually measure employee sentiment around safety and kind of track that over time. You see it's going up, is it going down? Are there hot spots within, within the company that need, need maybe particular addressing? And if you think about it from a company perspective, it's not like new employees don't come in and old employees go, right? So there's a kind of constant, you know, in and out of people, new, new people, right? So you have to constantly be working at it. You just can't say like, oh, I did that like three months ago, so I need to do anything again, right? Like, so there is a piece of this that is a constant, maybe drumbeat is one word to use, but maybe a constant focus is the word that I would use to ensure that the safety culture continues to stay where it is. And you know, I've been known to say that it's not the response of just the safety team, right? So this is where I mentioned before about Chris's executive team that you know he put together. We're all in it, right? And so you know, if I come to the executive team and say, "Hey, there's a certain hotspot in, in your org," they're looking at it like, "Okay, how can I do better there?" They're not looking at it well, like, "Okay, that's cool. I got other things to do." It's super important because this is how you kind of maintain that strong focus. The, the challenge is it's hard to stay there, right? Like. You know, it's, e- it's easy to make progress, I guess, if you're zero up to some number, it's really hard to stay at, at the top number. And so we spend a lot of time, constant reminders, constant things to employees about, about our safety culture, tools that are available, the accountability that's involved, even in an onboarding, like it's really ingrained in, in, in the company culture. So it's top of mind. How not not just the tagline top of mind either, right? Because people like to <laughs> call it a tagline, but not for us. How do you keep it that way? Yeah, like I, like I said, part of it is this constant focus on it to make sure that we're integrating it in different parts of the business where it needs to be integrated. So from the earliest employee experience, they learn about the fact that they can ground the fleet. They learn about how they can submit safety concerns. They learn about the safety case. And so these are things that are in addition to where am I getting my healthcare benefits? (laughs) Where do I get my paycheck? Right. And so I think this is how we've chosen to instill it in, in the company. Do you feel it empowers the employees? I can't tell you on a number of times I'll get side slacks from comp- from employees who might have come from other companies who are remarking about how a different experience it is. Now, I have no way to survey where they came from yeah. and how, you know, but I think from a standpoint of their sentiment, they have no reason to tell me something that they don't believe in. Where did your passion for safety first come from? Yeah, I think for me, a lot of it came from my my earliest days of understanding what, what the heck my, my dad did for a living. So my dad worked on surgical instruments. Oh, wow. And uh, surgical instruments that were used particularly around like people that typically had been in a, uh, in a bad car crash or something. And so you're trying to reconstruct their face, let's say, for oh, wow. example. That's very, intense. very specialized field, right, very intense. And I was always like, that is a cool way to help people. And so, you know, I got my, my undergrad degree and I thought I was gonna go do one, one part of that. Uh, and then I found myself at NHTSA and, uh, you know, there's kind of a saying for people that end up at, at NHTSA. It's like, you know, once you get there, you're, you're always there, yeah. even if you go off and do something else. And I remember one of the earliest tags line at, at NHTSA used to be people saving people. And I just thought that was such a unique thing early in my career that I could literally go home and tell anybody like today, I impacted somebody's lives who might never meet. That's pretty powerful. And I think for me, that's something that's been ingrained in me like from my earliest professional career. Uh, and here, I just feel like I'm doing it just with a different lens, you know, trying to bring a new technology to the market that's never been done before. Uh, and it has to be safe before it can do its thing. And so that's pretty awesome. Did your dad share stories or did you see photos that you shouldn't have seen as a kid that really ingrained in your head that's what we have to do <laughs> some some sometimes right uh sometimes I, I think his his unique skill set was he could talk to some md about a case and he would go like custom build them a special tool like on the fly like it was pretty amazing stuff but it was mostly around just his passion for trying to make these people you know have some sort of normalcy back in their lives the, the passion passed down it did you have the passion aurora's doing big things and soon to be driver out things. In your opinion, what is the future of Aurora from a safety perspective? Super bright, right? Like I think our approach is holistic, um, it's methodical. We've been transparent in the way that we're sharing it. 
we've been transparent in the way that we are addressing issues that folks raise. I don't see us going any other direction. And so for me, it's more about how do we scale this thing in a way that, you know, matches what the expectation of ourselves first, which is a high bar, uh, at least I, I believe the way that we've done it, it's a high bar, uh, and then kind of continue to bring this technology to market uh, in a way that can save some lives. I think what I worry maybe most about in kind of doing all of that is the the kind of reaction to, let's say, events that are beyond our control and kind of this tendency to maybe make it a bigger thing than it really is. We have to do our part to really understand in those situations what has happened. But I think there is a good role for whether it be media like, like you or whether it be important stakeholders in the ecosystem to kind of treat things with some balance uh, in a way that still re results in the right safety outcome, but doesn't result in a situation where we're sort of uh, presenting this bar of you know, zero or something like that, that would leave a whole lot of people on, on the table maybe for a long time, if that is indeed what we say is good enough. How do you avoid the collateral that comes when somebody does something silly or, st or, or stupid? I Meanwhile, well, you're sitting here being honest and transparent, but media or individuals just bundle it all together, and you and I know that it's, it's completely different. Luckily, I think in my case, I try to keep really good contacts with many of the, we'll call it the safety leaders around the industry, if they exist, right? And some of the companies, they're not there. So I can't talk to those people. But in the cases where they are, we talk. We also have more forums, right? So whether it's SAE is a good forum for that. Um, as you know, we have the Automated Vehicle Safety Consortium that mm -hmm. gets together and puts out best practices specifically for level four automation. By last count, I think we have almost everybody in there that is deploying in the near term or that has some form of deployment already. So that's a good sized chunk of the industry. And we work on legitimate safety things that we think, hey, it would be really nice if we all got together and had a best, best practice around this. So that's one piece of it. I think the other piece of it is just the normal SE standards process yep. that, that kind of churns along. A lot of activity in that camp too. And then there's other things like IEEE is involved. Uh, there's things that are happening globally with the, with the UN. And so I think the more that companies engage in these processes, uh, and these activities, I think the better off we will be as, as an industry. Uh, and so at least for my part, I try to kind of get more people around the table to kind of get us going in the same direction. You know, I can remember, you know, probably circa 2012 or 2013, you might remember there were certain activities going on. Yes. And I remember asking folks like, what's the form y'all are talking about? Like crickets, you know, because, no, <laughs> you know, that was a time frame when a lot of people thought, I don't need to talk to anybody. I can do it on my own. Yes. I, I think that has dramatically changed. Certainly, I think the NHTSA guidance had some influence on that. At least I like to believe that. It did. But I'm, I'm, I'm hap happier in the way that we've, where we sit in kind of 2024 than where we sat for sure in 2012, 2013. But there's more work to be done. We need more players around the table. We need to start tackling some of these other maybe more complex safety challenges that are that are being raised. I was actually talking to a, a fellow competitor uh, slash colleague uh, just before this. And, you know, I was talking about, you know, metrics is an area where I think we as an industry could probably do more uh, to really kind of be just a little bit more crisper on what are the metrics that really matter post deployment. So you've already made the decision to go, right? I think a lot of times we get caught in this, um, this circle around like metrics to launch and what we really should be focusing on is like, after you launch, what are you measuring and how are you keeping track of things? And so I mentioned this before, part of our safety case, that's a big piece of it. Like the decision's already done, how are you keeping track on it? And I think this is an area where we can be super helpful and measuring crashes is useful, but it already happened, right? We wanna get to the things that are before the crash actually happens from the system perspective, if there is indeed something wrong in the system or the operations or whatever it might be. And then you learn, and it ties into the, in Aurora's culture of transparency. That's been pretty clear throughout yeah, that. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, you're a business, and you are going to you are going to launch, and you're going to expand. And the question is, those new metrics. So at, let's go post launch. You're operating. Your customers are happy. 
do you expand the framework now? Because if you enter, let's call it the next phase of the business. Yeah, exactly. I think the beauty of the safety case framework is it actually allows you to do that. So remember I mentioned it's very, the, the way you structure the claims allows you to be very targeted in what you go after, like in, to, or it's not to go after, it's, you can identify what are the things that you need new evidence on. So maybe think of it like, I don't know, like Legos, right? They're like yeah. Lego blocks you can put together, you know, and put them together, you can make a house. So if we were building a house and we wanted to add an addition on, well, you go, you go add, add, add the addition on. It's very flexible in that way. In fact, if you look at the way we've done ours, it, it actually even encompasses our current operations today. So our, our framework, right, you can think about it, certain claims turn on because we have vehicle operators in the, in the cab, they're responsible for certain functions. As you solve those, then those claims get turned off, let's say, and then other claims turn on because you're now headed down the driverless path. And so there are certain things that don't matter anymore and there are certain things that matter now more. And so that's how it's flexible is when you can go to the next, if you know, if you add more trucks, well, you can't assume, for example, that your operational side that you were doing for fewer than that stays the same, right? So you go force yourself to go look at those claims and say, you know, is the evidence there complete or do I need to do some, some more? And you do that in advance. When Aurora rolls out your vans, your, your, your passenger side of the business. Uh, I was like, we're talking trucks. <laughs> oh, I know that, but, no, but I'm, I'm evolving in this. Do yeah. you build a new safety framework for that? I think what would, um, not what I think, what I know is that, again, like there are certain claims, for example, that don't matter for trucks. People messing around with inside the cab because there's nobody in there, yeah. right? But in the, in the past car environment where there could be somebody in there, well, that, those are claims that now we need to address. So that's how we built it, is that you can tailor it to the product that you have, but the basic methodology stays the same. So in, in that example, you the claims that you need to go now look at is the ones that have to deal with like passenger interaction inside the vehicle, you know, what about they need to get out, all these other kind of things that very much germane to that environment that are different. Likewise, you're probably not worrying about FF and CSA inspections or something like that that are very applicable to the commercial side that don't really apply to what you're doing on a, on a pass car side. Maybe pieces of those, but certainly not the whole thing, right? You're not checking hours of service records that you mentioned before. So then, you know, I think these are things that my perspective is having been in the department and worked with so many different colleagues in there is to actually be able to build this framework in a way that's uh, scalable with what, what the product that we're building and that we plan to put on the streets. You're building a great product. I give you a lot of credit from my perspective and the industry perspective. For, thank you for the honesty and the, and the transparency because your honesty and transparency, it's not only going to help Aurora, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help the whole industry. And that's, that's what we need a lot more in this industry. So thank you and to the leadership team at Aurora for doing that. Nat, we made it happen. We finally had you on. It's, it's, it's been too long, but we got to do this more often. It's been great. It's, it's been, been great, wonderful. Grayson. Thanks a lot. And it was a great, great, great conversation. Thanks for the, the questions. I, I think these are the right questions to be asking. And I think for my part, I think the more we can raise awareness about some of the thoughtfulness that's at least going on behind, we'll call it some players, I, I think that raises kind of all, all, all tides. So, so thanks for the opportunity to talk. You're welcome. Keep doing what you're doing. The industry thanks you. Today's tomorrow. Tomorrow's today. The future is a roar. Nat, thank you so much for coming on SAE Tomorrow Today. Thanks, Grayson. Thank you for listening to SAE Tomorrow Today. If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, please kindly rate, review, and let us know what topics you'd like for us to explore next. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.